Tonight, I'm very, very honored to welcome the brilliant Erica Armstrong Dunbar to the Free Library. A historian of the, ex yay, yes, clap, clap, clap. A historian of the experience of African-American women in America, Dunbar is one of the most important contemporary voices in our nation as we push to reveal, re-examine, and celebrate the previously unknown stories of black women who shaped the United States of America. Her excellent first book, A Fragile Freedom, African-American Women and Emancipation in the Antebellum City, started this public dialogue. It was followed by her landmark book, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge. Never Caught was a 2017 finalist for the National Book Award and won about, last count, a million other awards as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that there's a young reader's version of Never Caught as well. Erica is currently the Charles and Mary Beard Professor of History at Rutgers University and the National Director of the Association of Black Women Historians. Tonight, she's here to celebrate and discuss her newest work, which is just published today. It's her book birthday. The title, She Came to Slay, The Life and Times of Harriet Tubman. We're lucky to have her, and we're lucky to have her interviewer, the spectacular author, activist, professor, and playwright, Lorraine Carey. This is so fun. Two things. One, because she's my colleague in the English department at Penn, I know she's the most sought after instructor on campus. Two, and relevant for obvious reasons, she's the playwright of the upcoming Arden Theater production, My General Tubman, an exciting new play about the complex journey of Harriet Tubman and the impact she continues to have. So could there be a more perfect pairing tonight? No. We're absolutely thrilled to have them here with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming my friends, Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Lorene Carey to the Free Library. This is wonderful. Would you start us off with, uh, with a reading sure. from, from this, pick what you like. Sure. Um, so I think what I'll start with, one of the things, one of the things I decided to do with this book is to start Harriet's journey, not with her birth around 1822, but to really connect her to her African ancestry. And I think that's important when we're thinking about slavery, when we're thinking about uh, presence in, in North America. And so what I did was I made the decision to start with um, her grandmother who was brought to the colony of Maryland in the 18th century. So I think I'll start really with the beginning. Great. Lying in the belly of the wooden vessel, trying to remember when she had last seen her family. She tried to make sense of the nightmare of her life. It was as if she had stumbled into another world. Her eyes never adjusted to the complete darkness in the hold of the ship. The smell of stale urine, feces, and rancid vomit swallowed up the breathable air, leaving her nauseated and short of breath. She grew sick. Dysentery and smallpox were in the air, claimed the lives of the men and women all around her. Their dead or dying bodies were dragged to the top deck and callously thrown overboard. Their limbs and torsos would serve as shark bait. Though she managed to escape death, she grew weaker. Rations were limited, so she ate stingy portions of the food often stocked for the enslaved. Peas, yams, corn, and rice. Meat and fish were in short supply. 
and only eaten by the white men who spoke and moved with rage. Modesty was struck by her own transformation. Her legs, in particular, were weak. So weak, she wondered if they'd even be able to carry her weight or if they would snap and break like dried timber the moment she tried to walk with purpose. If there was one silver lining to her dramatic weight loss, it was that it placed less strain on her aching knees and feet when she was forced to exercise on the top deck. The less jumping and dancing on demand she had to do, the better. It was useless to try and count how much time had passed, so she waited, waited for death or deliverance, not knowing if they were one and the same. When the ship finally dropped anchor, she disembarked from her voyage, looking like a different person. Her thin and sickly skeletal frame was scarred in more ways than one. Her eyes met with a foreign land filled with strange sights and unfamiliar faces. The pale-faced men who had tortured her and her shipmates, those who survived and those who jumped overboard, a not so insignificant act of rebellion spoke a language that was rough to her ears. She would have to learn this new tongue, and she would need to learn it quickly. Having arrived in the colony of Maryland, like hundreds of thousands of other men, women, and children, she was sold to fuel the engine of American slavery. Her enslaver was a man named Adal Pattison, and once he concluded the purchase, he took her to his farm, and he would name her Modesty. Maybe it was in the blink of God's eye. Maybe it took her a lifetime. But eventually she came to understand that she would never again see her homeland or loved ones. She didn't succumb to whatever grief that knowledge produced. Modesty would do what millions of other enslaved Africans fought to do. She survived. Her strength and will were inheritable traits passed down to her descendants who not only survived, but also managed to free themselves from slavery's vice grip. Modesty would not live long enough to witness her granddaughter, Araminta Ross, grow tired of slavery's cruelty. She would never know that little Minty would become an American gladiator who fought and slayed the lion known as slavery. Modesty would not live to see her granddaughter change her name and become the Moses of her people. She would never know that the name Harriet Tubman would bring hope and strength to the enslaved and raging fury to their enslavers. This African woman planted a seed of resilience in her progeny that would blossom even in her absence. Will you talk a little about why, why it's important to begin there, why it's important to begin in Africa and bring us here? Yeah, you know, I think that um, when I, made the decision to write this book, I asked myself sort of immediately, what, what do I have to bring to this story? What do people already know about Tubman? What more do we need to know about her? And, you know, there are a number of biographies that have been written about Tubman. Um, and for me, what I wanted to do was to refashion 
Tubman story. Mm -hmm. And to remember that this was a story about an enslaved woman who did not just drop out of thin air or just at some moment in the 1850s lead many people to freedom, but that she was a person. She was a person who came from ancestors, came from people, people who witnessed great trauma and people who found a way to survive. And that, of course, she drew upon that strength. So for me, connecting Tubman's um, resilience, her strength, her courage, it was a direct connection to Africa and to the millions of enslaved people who managed to survive the Middle Passage and who found a way to create lives for themselves, even in the most oppressive conditions. Uh, she was a direct descendant of that strength. And you also bring up, as you talk about that, bring up the, the question of, of what versions of the Harriet Tubman story yeah. have, have been m most palatable, most popular, most reproduced. Um, well, tell us something about the, the Harriet that we've seen right. or heard or heard about and what else needed to be filled in to make that Harriet fully human, mm. maybe um, more, um, more, I don't, I don't want to use the word inspiring, mm -hmm. uh, but there is accessibility in this book. Um, it is easier to read than an mm -hmm. academic book, mm -hmm. and yet full of nuance. Yeah. Um, your interpretation in it is very confident, right, and, 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 um, and clear also accessible. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is it we needed to get yeah. that, that she, her story, her life, her actions had to offer that we, haven't, that we haven't gotten enough of? You know, it's funny. I, I think most people feel like they know Harriet Tubman. And um, they feel like they know her from that page in the high school history textbook where her, you know, her picture's like in the corner, right? Picture's in the corner. And so, but you know, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll tell a little story. Uh, my son will be mad that I'm bringing him up in the front, but cry Christian. So uh, my son the other day, he's showing me this, this app, TikTok. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's TikTok, right? Where they do these little videos or what have you. And so there was a TikTok that he showed me uh, th now, we, I, I can't say, you know, this is not verified. So supposedly uh -oh. this took uh -oh. place on the campus of Harvard University. Supposedly. I didn't see any signs, but. And um, there was an interviewer going around talking to college kids, um, students, and showing them a picture of Harriet Tubman and asking them, who is this? And all of the students said fairly confidently, oh, that's Rosa Parks. Or they just said, I don't know, right? Which um, was somewhat surprising. And then what I realized was that had they been asked, do you know who Harriet Tubman was? They all would have said, oh, oh sure. Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. The Underground Railroad, yeah, yeah. you know, took mm -hmm. people to freedom. Right. But they didn't necessarily recognize the photo. And... What I wanted to do, oftentimes the photos that accompany Harriet Tubman, you know, it's usually an elderly Har Harriet Tubman, head covered, um, hands clasped, always erect though, right? And um, what I wanted to do with this book, well, I wanted to do a couple things. One, I wanted to write a biography of Tubman that was accessible, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. allowed for me as a historian 
to move in, to do what I do, to write history, but to write it in a way that anyone could read. Mm -hmm. And that's my sort of commitment to mm -hmm. the democratization of education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Making certain that everybody has access. But the other thing I wanted to do was to give us a different Tubman. Who was this woman? Who was little Araminta Ross? Who was the five-year-old Araminta when she was taken from her mother and set out to work? She's five or six years old when she's um, removed from the farm that her mother lives on and she's hired out. It's the eastern shore of Maryland. There's no sort of need for, there are no large cotton plantations. There's smaller farms and um, she's not needed. And she's hired out. She's five or six. She doesn't have her adult teeth yet. And she is sent to work to empty the muskrat traps of her new owner. So, so think about this, right? A, a five-year-old with small hands attempting to open these traps and remove the, musk, the dead rodents and bring them to her new owner. And I wanted us to sort of follow Tubman to think about her as a child, to think about her as a teenager, what we would call a teenager now, as a young woman, as a married woman, and to also think about her after the Civil War because it's almost as if Tubman disappears after slavery mm -hmm. ends. And the reality is she lived an additional 53 years, <laughs> half a century after uh, the Civil War. And so I also wanted to tell that story as well because I think in many ways that's almost as inspirational as the time that she spent on the underground. It's, it's kind of crazy how much you get into a small spot. I mean, the, all these, the stories, there's the, the muskrats, there's the sort of um, Amelia Bedelia experience of having to clean a house yeah. at seven without her knowing How? what to do first <laughs> and then getting beaten every time because she didn't know that you, if you dust without the windows open, all the dust will resettle and then it'll be a problem. Um, her, the ox, talk, um, can I just do a couple of highlights mm -hmm. and you just tell us a story? Let's go. Oxen. Mm. You know, her handling oxen, one of the things oxen. about Araminta, we'll call her Araminta at this point because she's not yet renamed herself mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman, but, um, you know, she finds her niche really in the outdoors mm -hmm. and doing the agrarian mm -hmm. work. You know, the, mm -hmm. the domestic work, um, uh, for many reasons, wasn't her thing, aside from the kind of being under the microscope of her owner. Uh, being outside and doing, you know, harvesting flax and driving oxen. And, and she's doing this work as well as any man. And the people for whom she's working, they come out, they're, uh, they're betting on her, basically, or betting mm -hmm. against her at first, and then mm -hmm. they learn, mm -hmm. right? And, of course, she has no idea that she is building this strength that she will need later on in life, right? And she's also learning things about the environment, about mm -hmm. nature. Uh, she's learning about uh, berries and um, herbs and things that uh, the enslaved use for medication and for to cure illness because that's all they had. These things would become extremely useful later on in her life. And she builds her strength. She's five feet tall but strong, and in many ways on these, on the farm, outside, in the fields, she, uh, she's able to best any man. She's totally Simone Biles under, a, <laughs> under the dress. You know, it's that size with that explosive the strength. Power. Mm -hmm. Pow. Mm -hmm. Pow. The right. power. Right. So she, so the oxen story actually also has to do with money. Yeah. Yes, because the other thing she did was she hired herself out. 
she did. And then she yeah. did work. Will you talk to us a little bit about the money of all of this? So yeah. the, the money of hiring out, the money, how much it took mm -hmm. to run away, how much... Mm -hmm, uh, some mm -hmm. of that because one of the things we don't do when we talk when we talk about enslavement is we don't talk about the ways that people who did not own their own bodies did not own their own labor mm -hmm. managed to create wealth or yeah. create find operative create resources or use resources so yeah. there was yeah. the, the lawyer there yeah. was the mother yeah. There were, yeah wherever you like I think that to talk about tubbin and money makes a lot of sense these days right we've we're talking <laughs> yeah. about a $20 right. bill we are <laughs> we are we are with um, we are. with her likeness uh, attached to it we don't know when that will actually happen. But you know, I think before, I think it's easy for us and um, understandable to get sort of excited about the idea of uh, a black woman, someone like Tubman, to replace a slaveholder, uh, Andrew Jackson, right? So, or to at least be on the other side, I don't know what the, the details oh, were on that. Sake. However, really, uh, I do think that, <laughs> I think that we also mm -hmm. need to think deeply, though, about what it means mm -hmm. to put mm -hmm. the body in the face of an enslaved person who had a value attached to their body on, on a bill, that's on right. money. Yes. And, I'm, I'm, you know, that's, yeah. it's not knocking this idea of Tubman on a bill, but we need to be critical about this and about how value was attached to black bodies. And for Tubman, she was, she did sort of strike this deal, in part because she was so good at what she did, her agricultural work, and she is able to hire herself out. So she uh, agrees to pay her owner 50 to $60 a year, and anything else she makes, she's able to keep. So that's a significant amount of money in the 1830s and 40s, right? And uh, you would think, okay, what do you do with the money that you're able to keep? And uh, perhaps you're able to purchase uh, cloth to make uh, clothing for yourself or additional food or what have you. But <laughs> Harriet actually does something that most people don't know about. She hires a lawyer. A good lawyer. A good An lawyer. An expensive lawyer. Right? Yeah. She got yeah. money the for guy. a lawyer. The old white guy lawyer. And look, <laughs> she had things she needed to know. She did. Yes. So there had been right. these sort of rumors and suspicions. Mm -hmm. And I also think, and we could talk about this maybe a little labor, later, that, you know, Harriet said over and over again that she had, she had visions. So perhaps a vision kind of also hipped her to this, but there was some sort of funny business about uh, her mother's, uh, yeah. about a will that had been written by uh, the grandfather of her owner. And basically the will had given uh, Harriet's mother, Harriet Green, her freedom. At the age of 45, 45. she was to be set free, right. as were all of her children. Yeah. They were to all be set free at 45. Now, of course, this was ignored. And given the fact that the enslaved were illiterate, the majority of them were, who's reading a will, who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, they sort of knew, right? There were rumors. And so mm -hmm. she hired this lawyer with the money that she makes out in the fields, and he comes back, he scours the legal documents that are available, and he comes back and he says, you're right. That not only has your mother been uh, not given her freedom, she's over 45 at this point, but her three sisters who had been sold into slavery down further south had basically been sold illegally because mm -hmm. they were to have been set free at 45. And so this is a moment where we see an illiterate enslaved woman use the legal system, or an attorney at least, to figure out the law. And then, of course, make the decision, the clear decision that she understands that this will not be applied, they will not be adhered to in any way, shape, or form. And I, I can't help but think that that didn't inform mm -hmm. 
-hmm. her decision mm -hmm. eventually to run. Sure. Yeah. Will you talk a little bit about Harriet Tubman and men? Um, her father, Ben Ross, yeah. was um, really a love of her life. Yeah. She even worked under him in lumbering. So there was Ben Ross. She had brothers. She did. Uh, she had two husbands. She had men who worked under her in the Civil War. Um, she had people who would have been like her peer workers. Mm -hmm. In agriculture, yeah, yeah. Tubman. Talk about Tubman and men. I and I think it is something that I focus on in the book, mm -hmm. in part because we, in many ways, we don't think about Harriet Tubman connected to any man, right? Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. she's the warrior. She's the symbol. She's always photographed alone. It's just her. But no, um, she later on in her life she gave. Um, her account to a writer, Sarah Bradford, in 1869, and then reprinted several times later on. She talked a lot about her father, like you said, mm -hmm. as the love of mm -hmm. her life, the man that she, she cared deeply uh, for. They actually, as a family, they lived together for some time, but mm -hmm. then uh, they were separated. They were owned by different people, and therefore there was a 10-mile uh, distance between them. And um, however, she was able to work under him, near mm -hmm. him. Um, ben Ross would get his freedom eventually mm -hmm. um, as a sort of middle-aged person. And there's this moment in the book where I say, you know, here is this man who is able to work to get his own freedom on the eastern shore of Maryland. But what did that freedom mean if his entire family was enslaved? So here he is with his freedom as a sort of expert in, in lumber and uh, a valued worker who's watching his daughter work, driving the oxen, <laughs> and has little control mm -hmm. over her own life. And so I think it's interesting to think about her relationship with her father and then her relationship with her first husband, John Tubman. Um, and for those of you who've gone out who've seen the movie already, um, I'll, we'll try not to do any spoilers because, you know, a bunch of you probably haven't seen it yet. So um, I do think, you know, the, the film, we could talk about this maybe later, but I think the film, there's no, some departures. Okay, let's yeah. go there yeah, now. We can um, do that now. <laughs> I'm going to do what she says. Um, you know, I think there's some departures, and I think the film shows a very um, loving relationship between John Tubman and um, Araminta, who uh, many historians, we'd sort of disagree on yeah. at the moment she actually mm -hmm. becomes Harriet Tubman. There's some, a few historians who say it happens at that moment when she gets to Philadelphia and she's asked to rename herself, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some of us who say eh, it probably happened a little before. Um, mm -hmm. She took her husband's name, Tubman. Mm -hmm once they married in 1844, he was a free man, a free black man. And um, for him to make the decision to marry an enslaved woman, mm -hmm. I think that it says a lot. It says a lot about um, how special Harriet must have been to follow your heart, which is what John Tubman and, and Harriet did, also meant that any children he was to have with her would be enslaved. Um, and they lived together. They were married for about five years. Uh, they never had biological children. We don't know if that was intentional um, or not. But um, from Harriet's reports, she actually um, suggests it was somewhat of a, of a troubled marriage, that mm -hmm. he uh, was unhappy about her working away from him, um, earning money of her own. He made fun of her, um, the visions that she claimed to mm, have, mm -hmm. her deep sort of sense of, of Christianity. And so when she, um, when she runs, eventually, um, she, she, she runs with her two brothers at first, and this is another sort of departure from the film. Her first attempt at running away was um, with her two brothers, uh, Ben and Henry, 
and they took off in September of 1849, and at some point, a couple weeks in, the, the brothers um, get a little nervous. <laughs> It's dark, mm -hmm. they're hungry. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, let's think about it. You know, they're illiterate. They're no, how do they read a sign or a, there's no compass? Where are we going? And so they make the decision that it would be better to return and face punishment than to move forward with the unknown. And die. And die, right. Or worse. Or worse. Yeah. And so they make the decision where we're going to return. And, and Harriet says, wait a minute. I've left behind people too. I left my husband, I left you know, our parents, our siblings, um, but there's nothing that would make me want to return to that. And they literally drag her back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right, this is what we don't know about Tubman, right? <laughs> this is the story about Tubman we don't know. And um, you know, it's at that moment that Tubman really makes a decision that mm. no man's gonna make a choice for her like that again. And so when she returns, she's hearing the rumors that she's going to be sold, and then she takes off alone. And mm -hmm. the sort of idea of her traveling over 100 miles mm -hmm. on her own from the eastern shore of Maryland, to eventually to the Pennsylvania border, is amazing. I was driving down to the, the Harriet Tubman um, conference down in Cambridge, Maryland, for mm -hmm. her her stomp, old stomping grounds. And I remember just driving and I was like, man, it's taking a long, you know, I'm driving, right? <laughs> I'm like, man. And, and then, you know, at about like 30 minutes into me, about, I was starting to complain a little to myself. I was like, okay, Erica, get it together. Cause like she walked and took wagons and managed to get there on her, you know. So that was the moment where I sort of checked my 21st century uh, sensibilities and but to think about this woman making that journey alone and then when she gets to the Pennsylvania border and it's a beautiful moment in the film mm -hmm. you know where she's oh, I it, it's I haven't seen the film. okay well I won't okay it's no. a beautiful moment <laughs> that's all I'll say um, but at that moment she reports this later on you think this is the moment of, of joy and um, a sort of a release of fear. And what she says instead is something very mm -hmm. different. She says that almost immediately she arrived there and she was alone. Right. That her family wasn't there, her friends weren't there. And it was really almost at that moment right. that she decides she's going to go back and rescue all of them. So she's not sort of living the life of freedom, and I use air quotes because we know that technically she was not free. She was a fugitive and could be captured and taken back to the eastern shore of Maryland at any moment. Um, but she immediately thought about her family, and that would drive her for the next decade. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, let's talk about the gun. Let's talk about the gun. There's, the, there's a... We see this gun. Every time I said to someone that I was writing this play about Harriet, they said, you got the gun in there, right? <laughs> you got the gun. I know you got the gun. That's the part I really love, is the gun. <laughs> Will you talk about the, the whole gun? Yeah, thing, let's, please? let's talk about the gun. Please. I mean, the gun's on the cover of the book, right, so, you know. Right. You know, I, I sort of feel like with the, the, the gun in the book, when we think about the film, the gun is very sort of prominently placed in the trailers and what have you. And that's a big um, gun. It's, it's, a, it's big, a big gun. It's a in big that old gun. Um, not the pistol that she. She had it, right. Yeah, right. That she right. carried. That she could hide. She was packed. Right. She was strapped. Um, and she needed to be, right? You know, we, we don't, of course, um, most of, not all, but most of the images that circulate in textbooks, what's palatable, what is acceptable in, for curriculum, don't have her with a gun. Um, because we like to sort of think about her just ferrying 70 people to freedom <laughs> with luck and God and no weapons, right? <laughs> And each time she's moving back into the jaws of, of slavery, right? Um, and of course she's uh, 
she's packing, and she has to be. And not only does she carry this gun, and she talks about this later on mm -hmm. in, in her narrative, she, she says, you know, not only does she have to carry this gun in, in case of a bad situation with some bounty hunters or what have you, but she also needs it for the fugitives that she's rescuing. That um, she tells about this one uh, moment, the film kind of changes this a little bit, but there's a moment where she's uh, leading a group of fugitives through the swamps. It's cold. Harriet Tubman preferred to actually make her journeys in the winter and mm -hmm. fall, not the sort of summer and spring, the sort of typical times where mm -hmm. um, fugitives attempted to um, escape. And so she's leading them through marshy water and it's cold and there's a man in her party who makes the decision he's not going any further. He's tired. He doesn't know where he is, he's disoriented, he's angry, he's fearful. And so he says, forget it, I'm going back. And the rest of the party, they say, no, no, let's, you know, they try to convince him, look, we're, we're making progress, let's go. And he says, no, I refuse to go. And um, Harriet Tubman needed to convince him <laughs> that yes, indeed, he would be going. And she basically had to tell him, I mean, let's sort of think about this. She, she later on says um, that she could not let him go back, that he was indeed the weak link in the chain. And there was no doubt that if he returned, he would give up all the info. Everything. He would tell everything about the trails, the accomplices, those who helped. And Harriet couldn't risk that. She still had family members to go back and, and save. Um, and so she said she was not going to let one cowardly man interfere or interrupt um, this journey or her entire operation. So she, she tells him, you have a choice. <laughs> you can come or you can die. And really is this, you know, she has to make this decision. And there are other people who are with her who are also carrying weapons as well, right? They've stolen guns from their enslavers. There are people who are working with her there. It's not just Harriet with the gun, right? So there's this moment where he has to make a decision. Okay, is she serious? And he probably summed up hmm. that she was. <laughs> And if she had to um, kill him right there and bury him in the woods, she would, in order to continue rescuing the family and, and friends from the eastern shore of Maryland. So he decided to get himself together and go ahead <laughs> with her. So I, I do think, you know, we think about the gun as this sort of symbol of power. You know, and I think, you know, at a moment in time where sort of politically we're wrestling with the issue of weapons, right? And uh, what it means to uh, live in a state where you can um, carry a weapon concealed or not anywhere into schools, into churches, into, and so we're wrestling with that. But in the 19th century, this enslaved fugitive woman needed her gun and she needed it for her own protection, and to protect those she was ferrying to freedom. We're, we're going to take questions from the audience. I just, I would like to ask you, I, for years, I didn't even want to touch this because of that story and because it seemed to me that people liked to generalize that one time that she talked about and use it as an opportunity to show that all of these people who had the courage to run, that, that all of them would get halfway through and be afraid. Mm -hmm. And it felt to me mm -hmm. like a continuation of the American lie about uh, black lack of courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it pissed me off so much. That, that I couldn't even, I didn't even want to write about. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, eventually you get old enough so you get over your own <laughs> self. But does that does it ever worry yeah. you that there's this generalization or not? You know, I feel like there are so many other ways to. There were so many other people, and even in that one account where there were like mm -hmm. a, a number of them in in the swamp together, right? Mm -hmm. There was only one brother who was trying to return. For sure. Everybody else was trying to go, right? right? No, So totally. even sort of within that group of folks, you yeah. know, there's one, and I, I don't know, I think in some ways it just reminds us of the great fear mm -hmm. and um, the, uh, the fear of the unknown that kept so many people from not attempting to run, right? Sure. And, and many other reasons that they didn't. But I don't know, I, I think in many ways it's sort of um, Harriet Tubman just simply reminded him sure. that he had courage. He just had to find it. <laughs> Great. Hi. So um, other than that one account that you just talked about where the one uh, guy wanted to turn back, in your research, did you come across um, you know, details of specific encounters where they actually had to engage in battle with the people that were, you know, tracking them. Like, you know, actually shoot guns at, at these people that were trying to catch them. Right. So Harriet doesn't, um, and so part of what I'm basing this on is are Harriet's words, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's also very important when we're telling this kind of story to use the words of the center, right? So Harriet doesn't tell us that. She doesn't tell us that. She tells us about um, near uh, close calls, right? Mm -hmm. She tells us mm -hmm. about um, a moment when she's actually on a train. And so one of the things she would do is she would take the train actually back from Philadelphia towards Maryland because like who's expecting like a fugitive on the train <laughs> heading back south, right? It's actually a smart cover, right? She would dress as, a, as an older woman, sometimes as a man. Mm -hmm. um, and so she tells these sort of occasions about sort of close calls. So she's sitting near a, a person who she knows knew her. So she holds up a newspaper, right? She, hide, she hides behind a newspaper. But she never tells about um, a sort of physical encounter with, um, uh, with a bounty hunter or a catcher. And I think there were there were probably multiple reasons, aside from the fact she was just very good at avoiding them. Mm -hmm. um, if that indeed happened, um, to tell that story might have complicated things for her. Mm -hmm. And also that story probably would have gotten out. So I actually believe that she was that cunning that mm -hmm. um, good at what she did, that she was able to avoid um, catchers. And it's the reason why she was asked by the governor of Massachusetts to sign up and serve as a spy mm -hmm. and a scout in the Union Army, right? This is a woman who for almost a decade managed to avoid um, and to avoid the use of, of violence as well. Um, because nobody wants, you think about it, if you are in the act of this sort of operation, you don't want that kind of attention. You don't want to shoot somebody. You don't want to have the altercation because that's going to kind of blow your cover, right? Mm -hmm. And so for her, I think the genius is that she didn't and that later on that became something that was seen as um, uh, a skill set and that the federal government wanted a part of, too, with the Union Army. There was the Charles Null. Yeah. Oh, yes. And that, mm -hmm. so um, briefly tell sure. us about Null. She was willing to do uh, acts that required fighting she did. publicly. Men. For, but for re other reasons than simply to fight. And also, and that wasn't in the South, too, no, that right? Wasn't this in is in the, the North. So we know that, that uh, Tubman actually spends most, a lot of her time in Philadelphia and Cape May in the 1850s. Uh, but then later on, a home is actually basic, almost given to her for very little money in Auburn, New York. And there is a situation with um, 
a fugitive who she does attempt to help. She does help. She um, does. She and she him. does this by literally throwing her body in front of slave catchers and the authorities. And she's fighting them physically. But this is not happening in Maryland. It's not happening mm -hmm. in Delaware. It's happening in a state that, at least at that point, was not recognized as slavery, although the fugitive slave law still left her vulnerable. So she tells about uh, this moment where she literally is fighting tooth and nail to allow, to attempt to allow this man to escape, to keep the, the authorities away. There's another occasion, and this is after the war, um, where she's returning. Um, she's, the war is over. She's returning from Philadelphia on the train. She catches it here. She spends a little time with Lucretia Mott, uh, she's out near, around where uh, Camp William Penn was, and she's, she's taking the train to, back to New York. And um, she gives the conductor a ticket that was basically a comped ticket for vets, for people who had fought in the war. They got discounted um, uh, transportation. Military pass. Sure, a pass. Think, yeah. And um, the conductor sort of refused to accept it and refused to allow her to sit in first class accommodations. This is Philadelphia mm -hmm. uh, after the war. And so um, she refuses to get up. Oh, right? boy. Oh, she refuses man. to get up. Yeah. And um, he sees a five foot something woman and makes the decision that he's going to move her. Mm. And he can't. Right? He tries and uh, he, she won't get up. She holds on to the seat. And um, he's you. Exactly. Exactly. If my right. toe wasn't broken, right. I'd do that too. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. And he's, he's humiliated. Humiliated. Because he can't and, get and her rage. out of the seat. And exactly. And right. furious. And he goes and he gets his. He gets, you know, reinforcement, and they come and physically pry her out of the seat. And as they do it, they, they wrench her, her arm, arm back, this ripper. break her arm, yeah. dislocate the shoulder, and then throw her basically into um, second-class second accommodations. Three or four men? Yes. Yeah. And they, and they break her ribs as she's right. thrown into... Right. Um, this card. So, and I, I think it's important for us to remember that, and this is one of the things I try to do in the book, is like, okay, slavery's over, the Civil War is over, Harriet Tubman is free, there are no more slaves, and she's rescued hundreds of people at this point in South Carolina and those from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, yet this is how she's treated in this era following the war, as someone who participated in the Union, the first woman to lead a military expedition, a successful one, uh, and she's physically assaulted in Philadelphia. And so one of the things I wanted to also do with Tubman's story is to help us sort of see the, the problems and the challenges in life for black people following the war, that the end of slavery did not, of course, bring about um, the kind of change that people had hoped, and Tubman had to figure out a way to navigate that, um, that sort of choppy water, and she did it in a moment where um, eventually the sort of nadir in race relations, right, with the rise of, of violence, state-sanctioned violence, uh, against black people. And she's doing this now, though, in the North. She's living mm. in, in Auburn, New York, uh, with her family. She remarries. I love this part of the story because, <laughs> you know, she marries a man who's 20 years younger than she is, you know. Uh, you know, okay, Harriet. Um, she worked hard. Look. She worked really hard. Look. For a long time. She, uh, hey. You know. She deserved her tenderoni. There's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> and, but we don't think about this. When we, when we think about Harriet Tubman, we don't think about her with a husband who's 20 years younger, right? Who's, who was also um, uh, a Civil War vet. And um, so that's part of the other <laughs> thing that I wanted to do was to tell, to right. talk about her 
um, after sleep. Uh, the title, how did you arrive at that title? Hmm. Considering what you've said already. Yeah, she came to slay. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to do was to write a book that was about the 19th century, but to have it be a sort of modern, fresh, contemporary approach to have that. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't, you know, I was fiddling with a bunch of names. I'm not gonna lie, I was watching Beyonce's Homecoming. <laughs> And you know, I was just sort of thinking about like what are the contemporary <laughs> phrases or terms we use to describe the power of women, but more specifically the power of black women, right? So this idea of you know she came to slay, she slays all day, you know that's about black women handling their business, and and so. Um, you know, I, I had the, the title in my head, and I was like, oh, my editor's not going to like this. And, uh, but she was like, yes. Immediately, she was like, yes. And so when people started to learn what the title was, oh, my God, I love the title. So, I, you know, so it really wasn't, um, it was really just my attempt, once again, in creating an accessible book. Um, that brings us into brings the the present to the past to find a way to make those connections. That's that's where the the title comes from. Can you talk about the process of Harriet getting allies to help her with uh, the journey of the enslaved mm -hmm. she was rescuing? Yeah, that's a, a great question. The question was about allies and about Harriet uh, forming and really cultivating. Friendships, uh, but and she talks a great deal about mm -hmm. the importance of friends, of allies who help her escape, and then later on, sort of keep her afloat financially, mm -hmm. because that's the other thing. It's like, all right, well, if you're making money in Philadelphia, she's in Philadelphia, she's in Cape May, serving as a cook, a laundress. She's working in private homes and hotels. She's cleaning. She's saving money because each of these trips that she makes back to the eastern shore of Maryland, you know, she has to bring money in order to entice people, to help people, to keep her allies in place. She never names them. She can't, right? She gives um, descriptions of mm -hmm. some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and those who were um, sort of well-known kind of Quaker abolitionist type, she does tell us you know, who she works with, as well as um, William Still, who is represented in the film as well. Um, and I think this, you know, Tubman is someone who actually, she leans on these friendships, these allies. The majority of them are with white women. Right? When we're thinking about the financial support, and these are white women abolitionists who are also engaged in sort of these early years of women's rights, right, and women's suffrage. And so she creates these relationships during um, the sort of antebellum era, and they continue after the war as there's a move to fight for the right for women to have the, the right to vote. And so she keeps these relationships with mm -hmm. a Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth mm -hmm. Cady Stanton, mm -hmm. those types. Um, and she's also, you know, she's friends with John Brown, too. Like, that's in the book. She's, um, you know, she um, has a relationship with him. He calls her the general. Mm -hmm. He often refers to her with the male pronoun. Um, he comes looking for her, to her uh, for help with this revolution mm -hmm. that he planned. And she supported it. She was moving through her anti-slavery circles in New England, raising money for him. And in a way, sort of unlike Frederick Douglass, you know, Doug, Brown and Douglass were friends. And when, when Brown came to Douglass, he sort of said, man, like, that's a really bad idea. Like, <laughs> Harper's Fair, like, I'm good, I'm not going, right? Um, Tubman doesn't do that. Tubman actually is raising money for him until the, the very end. She tells him, actually, you need to have uh, the insurrection, you need to have this revolution um, around the 4th of July. 
he's delayed for reasons that doesn't happen right uh, until afterwards. So uh, she's actually in New England when the raid on Harper's Ferry took place. She, she'd been ill, and she, she talks about having a premonition, feeling mm -hmm. like something was wrong, but um, didn't know exactly what, and then she, she learned the news. So um, she has a, a complicated and really sort of genius set of allies, and Frederick Douglass is one of them too. One of the, the things I did in the book was I, I worked with a, a wonderful illustrator um, to help us sort of visualize Tubman and her relationships with people for whom we have no visual or pho photographic evidence, right? But we know that her and Douglas were friends. And Douglas writes about her, mm -hmm. and, he, and he applauds her, and he says, look, you know, I get all of this applause, I'm on these stages, I'm talking to people, I'm uh, revered, and all she's gotten are the, the hugs and um, prayers from the few, from the men and women she helps to shuttle to freedom, right? So she has these relationships um, that she maintains really through the end of her life. And um, she's very clear that these relationships help her do the work of, of freedom. Hello, beautiful women. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank um, you. I have perhaps a, a, a delicate question. Um, it ha it's, I'm asking uh, Erica, in, as from the place of a historian writing in the 21st century, how do you go about ascribing um, hardship, rigor? If I take as an example the story of the five-year-old young Harriet um, being asked to remove the muskrat from the, the traps and all of that, is the sensitivity, irritation, rage, anger, have to, does it have to do with the fact that she is enslaved and being forced to do that? Or is it in any case encompassed also by her youth to do that? I say that because it is quite familiar to me that black women having to work and struggle and do whatever will, um, just like, you know, at gunpoint or otherwise, make their children do um, things, activities, that they, that they perceive to be just the rigors of life. Mm. So in the instance that you have, um, you know, you, that you've written about, is it the fact that she's a child doing it or is it because she's enslaved? And I bring, you know, comically to example, the fact that you're driving down to Maryland and, uh, and in our 21st century minds, we would be very quickly discomforted, mm -hmm. but yet, Many of the old folks will tell you, "Well, child, I had to do what I had to do." Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. If you'd comment I, on I'm, that, I'm I'm glad you asked that question because it, for me, just thinking about Araminta, right, as a child, as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old, um, I think it's really important to focus on multiple aspects of that story in particular in part because it reminds us of the introduction of hard labor for enslaved children. That there is a sort of entry point that happens. And for, for Araminta, it was at the age of five. And so what I wanted to do using that story, of course, to talk about the, uh, for, for those of us with 21st century sensibilities, right? It, it does invoke a, a rage and anger um, uh, a sadness. But I also think as the historian who teaches African American history that it's important to understand that you know it doesn't just happen when you're 20 or 18 or what have you and in the fields that this is something that you inherit slavery and the responsibilities that come with it at a very early age. Her mother did everything she could to help her prevent her from the hardships of that labor, but in essence, she had very little power. Every time Araminta got sick, she got the measles, um, she would return, because she couldn't work, she would return to her mother who would heal her, who would sort of bring her, help her regain her health. And um, 
I think that also shows us the importance and the power behind family and behind even the under the, the worst of situations. It reminds us of the power and the love that enslaved people had practiced, nurtured, and held on to. Um, and so in many ways, sort of thinking about Araminta beginning, and this, this question asking us to think about her childhood, I think is sort of full circle because we often think of Tubman as an older woman, but it, we have to go back to, to who she was as a child and as I started, back with her, with her ancestors. In that story also, it's very clear that she was being used in a way um, that is more disposable than a, than a parent would do. So, and I think the, the book makes clear that there's, there's the hard work, but there's also the hard work um, without interest in the, her health. So she was worked to illness and then sent to the mother see if she can get back and then brought back and worked to illness some more. She did not do what a master said um, when she was 12 and then he threw the weight, the two pound weight that made the dent in her skull, cracked it in. Then she was laid because they had no bed for her there on a loom stool a bench. A bench for three days till she was able to get up again. They put her back into the um, into the field. Now, blood so, dripping, she couldn't see. She couldn't see because the blood was in her eyes. So, so this is not just about hardship, but it's about using human beings as stock, mm -hmm. as disposable stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a different thing from mere, from hardship, which, which every poor person in the 19th century and, and now experiences. And it, it also yeah. makes us think, uh, maybe we, you know, I like to sort of end on um, on the upbeat. Um, yeah, which this, which isn't. This was not that. Not where we are. Um, but I do think that upbeat. when we think about the, the body, the, the trauma um, tagged to black bodies in the, the period of slavery, right, the fact that Tubman lives through this, right, skulls fractured, She's whipped, she's, you know, she's brutalized in the ways that many others were. But the fact that she still has the physical strength to make 13 trips to and from the eastern shore of Maryland, sort of, in many ways, it clearly doesn't erase the trauma, but it shows her survival and her strength, and I think that's one of the things that we love about Tubman, is that she does symbolize that strength. She does symbolize um, the fight and finding some path to happiness or freedom. And you know, I, that's what I want people to, to walk away with, with this book. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.